Amen. Jesus is stronger, and we celebrate his love today. Well, I am so glad to be in God's house on this very special weekend, and uh, we are wrapping up a series over the last several weeks we've been calling Hostage, and we've been looking at some of the times that we have felt hostage in our lives and remembered that, that God wants us to live in freedom. God doesn't want us to walk in, in oppression or depression or bitterness or anger. And today we're going to continue that, that uh, series. I'm excited. Next week I'm going to begin a new series entitled Words from the Fire. And it's going to take us through June and July as we look at the Ten Commandments for today and what God would say to us that He spoke to Moses back in a burning bush some 4,000 years ago, and yet how relevant those words are to our life today. And I believe God wants to speak to us in some new and fresh ways over these next several weeks. So I invite you to be here and invite others to come and join us for this new series, and I believe it's going to be a very powerful, very powerful time together. As we dive into the Word today, I invite you to take your Bible and look over at Psalm chapter 139, 139, and we're going to look at verses 23 and 24. It's a prayer of, of David. It's a prayer where he is seeking God and his purpose and his plan for his life. It's a very powerful prayer. And as we dive into the message today, I'd like for this to be our prayer that we would say these words to the Lord. And would you stand with me? And I'd invite you to just say these words aloud with me. And let's make this our prayer today. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. You see those key words? Point out anything that offends you. Kind of touch that sore spot. Find that spot that I've been covering over. Point it out and lead me in a path that goes to everlasting life. May God bless his word today. You may be seated. Now, kind of as a way to set up the topic today, uh, I, I would want to tell you a little bit of a story. I have an old preacher I have a preacher friend who uh, kind of told a story of something that happened in his life. It's one of those old preacher stories that some of us have heard, some of us have been a part of, that we have experienced. And, and it's kind of an old preacher trick that preachers like to play on people through the years. And, and a guy that I actually know, this happened to him when he was a teenager. And he wasn't a believer back then, but he, he was very interested in his spiritual things and really was intrigued by, by Scripture, and, and God was leading him along the, the pathway of knowing him. And one Sunday, the preacher stood up, and he said, next week, I begin a new sermon series, and in preparation for that week, I'm giving you the assignment that I want you to read a chapter from the Bible. And so everyone here, when you go home this week, I want you to read this chapter of the Bible in preparation for the service next week as we begin this new series. And, and this guy thought, well, I could do that. I'm kind of interested in seeing what the Scripture has to say. And so the pastor says, I want you to read Mark chapter 17. I want you to read the whole chapter in preparation for the service next week. Well, the service ended. He went home and he said Monday. He kind of forgot about it. Tuesday, he thought, oh, I need to do that. And he forgot about reading it. Wednesday passed by and he didn't read it. And all of a sudden, by Thursday, it was completely out of his mind. Sunday came again, and he came to service, and, and the pastor stood up and said, okay, last week I gave an assignment to read Mark chapter 17. I'd like to know how many of you read that chapter. Well, without even thinking, he raised his, head up, uh, his hand up. He was just going, you know, I, I know I didn't read it. I know it's a bold-faced lie. I didn't read it. I forgot all about it. I, I just, you know, I'm embarrassed that it, it didn't happen, and yet I, I'm just, I, 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 I did and he noticed there were only just a few other people that raised their hand. And, and he thought, man, I'm, I'm pretty good. Look at all these other people. They didn't follow through with the assignment, but I did. Well, the pastor says, you know, to show you know, our appreciation and acknowledge these people that have completed the assignment, I want them to stand, and I want to applaud them. So a few people stood, and everybody applauded them, and they sat back down. And the pastor said, okay, as we begin the message today, 
I'd like everybody to take their Bible. The Bible is in front of the, the pew rack in front of you or the chair rack. and Open it up to Mark chapter 17. I'd like for us to read this together. So this teenager pulled the Bible out of the pew rack in front of him and opened it up and found the gospel of Mark and looked at Mark chapter 14, Mark chapter 15, Mark chapter 16, Luke chapter 1. And he's going, I can't believe somebody tore a page out of the Bible. And the pastor, seeing the bewilderment on some people's faces, said, well, I have a confession to make. The Gospel of Mark only has 16 chapters. And today I would like to speak on the sin of lying. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but uh, I want to talk about lying today. And in this whole series of messages that we've been looking at as we've talked about things that take us hostage, I have to be really honest with you. That's been one of the most difficult series I've ever preached because it kind of hits me upside the head and it hits all of us upside the head when we deal with bitterness and we deal with anger. We deal with anxiety and worry. We deal with lying. You think about that. And to get us on the same page, I'd like to just ask you a simple question. How many of you have ever lied in your life? Now, I want you to keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. I want you to look around and find those people that don't have their hands up and say, you no good low-down liar, you. <laughs> you know, the truth is, every one of us have lied. And, I, and I'll tell you what, it's probably the most interesting thing about lying is nobody has to teach you how to lie. I mean, lying is just one of those things that just comes naturally. It's, it's one of the very first things we learn to do. It's not like me as a parent, you know, I had my boys together, Zach and Jacob, say, okay guys, it's time for your lying lesson. Come over here and let's sit down. I'm going to tell you the, 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 the fine art of lying. And I didn't have to do that. I mean, they were naturals at it from the very beginning. You ever seen a little kid come in or somebody come, they got chocolate all over them. They've got cookie crumbs all over them. You say, have you been in the chocolate? No, I haven't been in the chocolate. I mean, nobody taught them to do that. They just do that natural. And, and how many times do we as adults continue that pattern? Oh, I, 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 boy, the traffic was really bad this morning. It's not that we just overslept. It, it's, it's, it, well, you, you know, I, I had so many things come up. It's not that we forgot to do what we were supposed to do. And so all of these these things come about, and, and we kind of laugh about it, don't we? We think it's a, it, at times it's just a little bit cute, but the truth is, it's not acceptable to God. We, we think certain parts of it are funny, but we take it for granted in our society that people are going to lie and people are going to deceive us, and you know, that's just the way a politician is or the way it happens, but, but the fact is, if you're telling, taking notes, you might want to write this down. God hates lies. God, he hates lying. Matter of fact, look at this scripture. It says in Proverbs chapter 22, the Lord, the Lord detests, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the truth. The Lord detests lying lips. The Hebrew language here, when it talks about detests, is literally, the, the word literally means something disgusting. It's something that makes you nauseous. I think a very vernacular translation would be, uh, if the Lord detests, the Lord wants to throw up, is probably a more vernacular translation of that, that it turns his stomach when we lie. And, and I wonder if that's because lies come from the enemy, the enemy Satan. You look at the scripture in John chapter 8, verse 44, it says, Satan was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When Satan lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And, and I wonder if, if one of the reasons it just turns God's stomach, he detested, is because this, this angel, this perfect angel, it seemed like this, this heavenly being chose to turn against from God and become this deceitful, detestable liar. He's the father of lies. And what I want to talk to you about is, 
is four really big things uh, this morning. One is how, how is it that we lie? And then I want to talk about why, why we actually deceive um, others. And then I want to talk for a few minutes about how do we break the cycle of lying and live in the truth, because I believe that God wants us to be transparent in a way that His Holy Spirit can work in us and cleanse us and change us. So the first, first question is this, how do we, how do we lie? How do we, how do we deceive? Uh, the first is others. We lie to others. Jeremiah chapter 9 says this, friend deceives friend and no one speaks the truth. We lie to other people. I read a statistic recently that said that women, on average, typically lie three times a day. I don't know, is that true? Well, that'd be a lie, I guess, wouldn't it? <laughs> and, and, you know, and us guys would go, see, I told you. But, but the same statistic said that men lie six times a day. <laughs> Double that. Well, you should have saw the big fish that I caught. You know, you, you, you know, you, you, boy, I'm doing so good, and I'm, I'm just bringing home the bacon, and I'm getting so much accomplished, and, and we just tell stories. Well, I don't know if that statistic is true, but we can make statistics say about anything we want them to say. But instead of saying, I overslept, we say, well, the traffic, boy, I couldn't even get through it this week, you know, this going to work today. Or instead of telling her the truth about those pants, we say, man, those are great. Um, and, and I don't know what it is, but we just, we just tell stories, don't we? We lie and we, we tell stories and we, we kind of laugh about it, but God, the Scripture says, detests lying lips. And I wish I could say as a pastor that I've, I've outgrown that as I've matured and as I've pastored and as I've read the Word and as I've, I, as I've prayed. But I have to be really honest with you, I, I don't think I have. Matter of fact, I know I haven't. I think about the lies that, that I've told. Well, I'm going to start exercising tomorrow. Or I'll call you right back. You know, give me that and I'll get that right back to you. Or this will only take five minutes of your time. <laughs> you know, if you'll just stay in the class for about just a few weeks, we'll get somebody to replace you. Um. We, oh, I wasn't sleeping, I was meditating. <laughs> we lie, don't we? We lie to others. Another way that we lie is not only to others, but we kind of take this for granted. We don't pay attention to it. We don't see the importance of it often as we lie, we lie to God. In Acts chapter 5, there's a story in the early church when all the believers were, were getting together and the church was just exploding and they had all things in common and they began to sell their possessions because there were people in need and they began to put all the money into a common treasury to meet the needs of, of anybody that, that had, had a need. And the, the people decided that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell this and I'm going to give all the money and I'm going to sell this and we're going to put all the funds in here because there, there's such great needs and we want to be a part of it. And there's a story of a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. And, and they're apparently a very well-to-do family, a, a family that loves the Lord, and they've come to faith in Christ. But they, they got a little creative in their, their business dealing. And, and instead of giving all the money that they made and selling some property, they decided they would hold some back for themselves. And Peter confronted them, and he said this to them in Acts chapter 5, verse 4. What made you think of doing such a thing? You not lied to men, but to God. You see, it's not just lying to people, it's lying to God. And, and I don't think it was the issue is that they had to give everything away, but they said they gave everything. They said to the community of faith, oh, look at us, we're so faithful and we're so committed. We sold that property and we gave all of it to the Lord. And that wasn't the truth. It was a lie. It was detestable. It was, it was nauseating. And, and I don't know how to far to take that, but if you extract from this, from this story, maybe this idea that if you misrepresent the truth to your Christian community or in another way you deceive those around you, you actually are deceiving God. 
You're actually lying to God. And, and the more you lie to others and the more you lie to God before long, then, then pretty soon you're just telling lies and you can't tell the difference between what is false and what is, what is true. And the darkness really gets dark. So you lie to other people, you lie to God, and the third one is probably the hardest one is we lie to ourselves. We lie to ourselves, we deceive ourselves. And, and I love this prayer of David in, in Psalm 119, he says this, he's grieving over something, he's upset about something, and he says these words, help me to understand the meaning of your commandments, and I will meditate on your wonderful deeds. I weep with sorrow, he says. Encourage me by your words. And then in verse 29, this is, this is so powerful. He prays this, keep my lips from lying. He says, keep me from lying to myself. Keep me from deceiving myself. Keep me from lying to myself. Give me the privilege of knowing your instructions. And probably the truth is, quite honestly, there are many times when we just lie to ourselves. Oh, it's going to be okay. That really doesn't matter. And we deceive ourselves, and then we begin to, to believe our own lies. Yeah, I, I talk with people all the time that do that. Probably one of the biggest heartbreaks that I experience as a pastor is having people come in off the street needing things. And those of you who have been pastors and are pastors know that. And, and they come in and they tell you this amazing story. Had one lady come in and tell me that she had just lost her baby at Children's Hospital in Little Rock. And had come home to make arrangements and didn't have money to go back and get the body. It was a newborn. And she was crying and she was upset. Had her sister there and they needed money and they needed gas and they needed all. And, and it was a perfect story. She even gave me a copy of her driver's license. She told me where she lived. All of that. I was just so heartbroken. I gave her a, I had a gas card. I had some cash in my wallet. And I usually don't give away money. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty strict about that. And, and, she, and I just, I prayed with her. She got in the car and drove off. I gave her some food, too. And then I called the hospital. Oh, we haven't had a death in the hospital for two weeks. Well, what about this name? Oh, we've never heard of that name before. And I, oh, got me again. <laughs> I, I, and I, I could tell you story after story, and probably all of us have stories where somebody has deceived us. Somebody's said some things and, and made up some, some people are just miraculous liars. You, you, you hear them and you just, you fall in love with them because they're just, their stories are so heart-wrenching and so heartbreaking and, and you know that people do have those stories and that's the hardest thing. You know that people have heartbreaks and have heartaches and they have needs and these other people are so deceitful, they take advantage of that and they know how to manipulate people and they... They lie. And then what's so amazing is they've lied so much they can't distinguish between what is true and what is false anymore. They are so bought in that even when you find out what's going on and you confront them, they still deny it. I mean, you can have the proof right in front of them, but they are so consumed that they've deceived their selves. You've got a problem. I don't have a problem. Uh, there's nothing wrong here, but it's right here. No, well, that's no problem over here. I'm, I'm good. And you try to help them. And, and you think about it in a marriage relationship. Well, I'm not the problem. She's the problem. Or I'm not the problem. It's his problem. And then you forget that, it's, that in a marriage, you're both part of the problem. Or, or it's, it's the biggest fear I, I have is that, that we get so deceived in our own standing with God. Oh, I know God loves me. I know, oh, I haven't gotten close to him. I haven't gotten into his word. I haven't really talked to him in a while. But, and we miss out on what God has for us. You know, when I was a teen, I, I didn't know Christ. And, and, and I, I did the game. I was the president of my youth group and, until I became a Christian. And, and then I wasn't the president anymore. Um, I, don't, I don't know how that happened. But... Uh, but when I came to faith in Christ, you know, I've, I've met a lot of people through the years, and you'll talk to some people, and they're, they're kind of glazed over in the face when you talk about spiritual things. And they nod their head, but there really doesn't seem to be anything beyond the back of the eyeball. 
It, it, you talk about spiritual things and there's just no, no depth to it. And then you talk to some other people and you know that it's real. The, the, you can tell their lives are different and they're celebrating and they're so excited about what God is doing and you see evidence of the spiritual growth in their life. And, and I'm, not, I'm not presuming to judge somebody's heart, but the Bible says that you'll know a person by their fruit. And if there's no evidence, then there's a question, is there even an experience? John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, verse 4 says these sobering words. Whoever says, I know him, I know God, they say, I, I know him, but does not do what he commands, that person is a liar, and the truth is not in him. How do we lie? Well, we lie to ourselves, we lie to God, we lie to others. Well, the question then goes, the next step is, is why do we lie? And, and I think this is the more difficult question. This is the most challenging question to deal with. And, and I think the big issue is we just find it easier. We, we, find, it, we find it easier to, to tell a falsehood than to tell the truth. And it's kind of like, I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to make myself look bad. I, I believe this will help me get ahead. And for others, all of a sudden the lies start snowballing where we can't even find the truth anymore. What about you? Why do you lie? Why is it that we believe that in a, in a moment of time that it's, it's more advantageous and it's better and it's more righteous to be false than it is to be true? Some might say, well, I do it because I hate to disappoint people. Or, or, or I do it because I, I want to impress people and get them to do what I want to do, manipulate them. Or maybe somebody else says, well, I'll do it. I do it mostly to protect myself. Because if I, if I really told the truth, then I would be vulnerable. Somebody might say, well, I do it to make myself look better. I tell all kinds of stories that I have a degree or I have certain training or I have certain knowledge or I have certain skills. And I really don't, but I... But I just want to kind of beef, beef myself up a little bit. Or somebody might say, well, I, the, the real issue is I really don't like the truth. I don't like my life. I don't like anything about me. And so if I, if I told you the truth, I would have to be too vulnerable and too honest. Some might say, well, I'm afraid of what other people will think if I really told you what was, what was real. And I think the real root here that I see in my life and I see in so many people's lives is we, we lie because we tend to think that my lie is better than the truth. It's better to tell a story than it is to honor God. For example, is this, okay, if I, if I lie, it will bring me security. And the truth is, when I lie, I'm more insecure. And the bottom line is you can't build a life on a lack of integrity. Or maybe we think, if I lie, I'll, I'll, I'll get more of what I want, but the truth is you always get less than what you want. Or we say to ourselves, if I lie, you'll, you'll like me more and we'll have a better relationship, but the problem is in lies, the relationship is always thwarted. It's always inhibited because a lie gets in the way. So what do I... I have, I believe something that's not true, and it's stealing me from what I really want most. So how do we stop lying? How do we stop the falsehood and, and, and move into the truth and what is, was really righteous and what is right? First thing, I think, is we capture the wrong thoughts. The Scripture says this in, in 2 Corinthians 10, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive, that word on your outline, you ought to circle that, take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You know, as we talk about being a hostage, and these things, how they hold us in a prison. And, and sometimes we feel like, even though we're not in a prison, we feel like we're in a prison because of anger or bitterness or worry or lying. And, and wouldn't it be amazing, instead of that taking us hostage, we take it hostage? What if we turn the, the tide, instead of the peer pressure bearing down on us, all of a sudden we become the peer pressure? 
All of a sudden, instead of us caving in, all of a sudden we become the persons that set the direction that people follow or we establish. We take captive every thought. And so the first thing I've got to do, if I'm going to win over this thing, if I'm going to defeat the lies in my life, and it's so easy to, to buy into that, is I've got to take all of those thoughts and those issues that come in my life, and I've got to take them captive. And, and the key there is I've got to make them obedient to Christ. I love what Paul says in Philippians. He says, whatever's lovely and pure and admirable and trustworthy and praiseworthy of good report, think about these things. About put them into practice. Make them part of your life. Think about such things. Take it captive. Put the good stuff in instead of being held back by the, the bad stuff. Second thing I think we have to do is this. Hold your tongue. Hold your tongue. If you want to sin less, talk less. That's good, isn't it? Proverbs chapter 10 says, your, when words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. You know, the less I talk, the less I exaggerate. And the less I exaggerate, then the less I have to regret that I've said. And the less I have to regret to said, then the, the more open our relationship is. And the more open a relationship is, the more truth I tell you. And, and, and we need to sometimes consider kind of decreasing the number of words that we say. Decreasing pause before we speak. I love this passage in Psalm chapter 141, uh, verses 3 and 4. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Let not my heart be drawn to what is evil, to take part in wicked deeds with men who are evildoers. Let me not eat their delicacies. You know, sometimes those words are tasty, aren't they? Let me just spit it out, not to ingest it. Set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my, my lips. Proverbs chapter 17 says, Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. I remember growing up hearing the story of Mark Twain, and Mark Twain would take that, that verse, and he kind of made it a little more colloquial in his way of doing it. And he said, uh, It's better to keep your mouth shut and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. (laughs) Amen. Third thing I believe the Scripture tells us to do is to speak the truth. And I think this is one of the hardest things to do, is, is to close our mouth when it's time to close our mouth and to open it when it's time to open, to be able to say what we need to say, that we will speak the truth in love. We, we won't lie. We won't distort the truth. We won't, we won't manipulate. We won't play with words to twist them around. But we'll say from this day forward, I commit to being honest in my speech. I commit to telling the truth. And, and I commit to, to being so, I'm, I'm just going to draw a line in the sand here. That I'm going to step over that line that, that I'm not going back. I'm drawn. I'm no more exaggeration, no more lies. And then we tie that in to what Proverbs chapter 3 says, where it says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. When it says, speak the truth, it is so key for you and me. But you've got to remember, it says, speak the truth in love. And too many times we think, well, I'll just, I'll just tell you the truth. I'll tell you what I really think of you. I'll tell you what, how you're really messed up here. I'm going to tell you what's really wrong here. And the Scripture says, no, no, you've missed the point. You speak the truth and you speak it in love. And Proverbs says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. That, that if you separate the truth, if it's, just, if it's only just the sentimentality, then everything gets watered down. If it's just kindness, then it's just ishy-gushy stuff. But you add to that love and faithfulness. Faithfulness, and and, and and I'm committed to you. I'm going to see this thing through. I'm going to stay in the process. I'm not going to just do a drive-by shooting with my words, but I'm I'm going to encourage you and love you. And sometimes that means I'm going to say the hard thing. I'm going to say that, that what you're doing is wrong, or I'm going to say, no, I don't like that. No, I don't want to participate in it. No, that's not what I think. No, that's not okay. No, this is what I do believe. This is what the Scripture says. We pair those two together, truth and kindness. One without the other can be deadly. 
But there's those who, who show God's love and His grace by being forthright and upfront and speaking the truth. Psalm 19 says, May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Well, the question is, what is, what is the truth? What, 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 what is the real truth? Uh, you kind of imagine it this way. Over here, you've got, a, you've got the word truth, capital T, big T, big truth. And, and, and that's God's truth. And, and, and God is saying, this is the way life really is. That's what it's really all about. Over here, I've got, I've got me. And, and if the greater the distance between me and God's truth, the more apt I am to, to kind of just stretch a little bit. The more apt I am to tell a falsehood or tell a lie or not be completely honest or just kind of let things go or, or say something just to please you. But the closer I get me to the truth, the more I line up with Him and His truth becomes part of my life, then all of a sudden I begin to speak the truth in love and I find that, that right and righteousness begin to reign in my life and I'm, and I'm less apt, I'm guarding my mouth a little bit more, I'm, I'm being careful what I say and how I say it, I'm pausing before I just respond. Yeah, you know, it just, that's one of the things I have to work on is instead of just blaring it out and saying it, stop and sometimes just wait three seconds. It's amazing how a conversation changes. But then speak the truth in love. Do it in righteousness. And all of a sudden, when I get that distance shorter, I, I realize that I can live in this truth. But if I let that distance grow and the truth is over here and I'm over here, pretty soon all of a sudden I, I have a lie and another lie and another lie and pretty soon I, I feel like I have to lie. But the closer I get to God's truth, I realize that truth is not, truth is not just an idea. Truth is a person. Truth is Jesus. Jesus said himself, I am the way, the truth and the life. That the more I live in Him, the more honest I am, the more righteous I am, the more, the more I'm, I'm living in truth. And I'm living in the truth that He says about me. He says, I'm forgiven. That, that when I call upon Him and I confess my sins, I'm not the same person I was. He says that I'm His righteousness. I'm the righteousness of Christ instead of walking in, in oppression and depression and, 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 and sin. He says that that he is with me and will never fail me or forsake me. He, he says that, that I am who he's created me to be. And he is continuing to work on me to shape me. And all of a sudden, the closer I get to the truth, the more I do the truth. And the more I follow the truth. And the more the truth is in me. And suddenly, I don't have to lie as much. I don't have to lie even at all. You, know, you have to be honest that when you lie, it gets a little scary, doesn't it? Because you forget sometimes where you told that story and where you told a different story. And you think, who's going to catch me? But when we believe the truth, then Jesus said in, in chapter 8, verse 23, this amazing verse, and you will know the truth. The capital T. You'll know this, this truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. This truth that I live by. So, so it's the little, the little white lies and the little make-believes and, and, and the little living of a lie deceiving those around me. I, I reject and I draw closer to the truth and I start believing the truth. I start believing what God is saying and what God says in his word and what God is doing in my life. And the scripture says that his truth sets me free. So why do I lie? I stop believing the truth. I Stop believing what God is saying because I'm over here instead of over here. But when I draw near to him, the capital T, the truth upon Jesus, all of a sudden 
I start living in the security and the grace of God. That I know who I am and I know who he is. And I know where I'm going. And I can live in that. And so today and every day, we pray, God, wake me up. Wake me up to who you are and what you want to do in my life. Wake me up to where you want to take me. Wake me up that I would live in your truth because I will know the truth. And if I know the truth, the truth will set me free. And the more I believe in his truth and the more I live in the truth, the closer I get to him. And the less I feel like I have to lie. The more I'm aligned with him, the freer I am. That's revolutionary, isn't it? Who doesn't want to walk in freedom? And yet so many times we do exactly the opposite of what God says how to get there. You shall know the truth. The truth is Jesus, and the truth will set you free. In a moment, we're going to pray together. And when we pray together, I'm going to invite you, those of you who is God speaking to, to respond in one of two ways. One is... One aspect is confession. And in, in, in confession, to be able to say, first of all, to God, God, I, I want what you want. Forgive me of my sins. And, and I love 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, I don't, I don't want to live a lie. I want to live in your truth. And there's some people that are going to say, Lord, that's what I want to do today. I want to confess my sins to you and receive your grace and your forgiveness and live in your truth. And then there's another confession, not only confessing to God, but there's second confession. When we've confessed to God, we get forgiveness, but, but there's a second confession where we confess to others. And when we confess to others, we receive healing. James says, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. That there's something about me talking to somebody. And, and so when I admit to another person and I, I confess to them and I even say, forgive me, and they forgive me, all of a sudden a relationship is healed. My heart is healed. The truth is exposed. I don't have to be bound by a lie anymore. And in a moment, we're going to have prayer time. And as we do, I'm going to invite some people to come up and just be prayer leaders with us. And if you'd like somebody to pray with you, they will be here to do that, to confess to God, or maybe just to confess to them. Or maybe there's another situation where you need to just talk to somebody else to say, you know, when I said that the other day, that wasn't exactly the way it was. Or when I didn't say what I, you asked me about and I didn't say anything, that wasn't exactly the way it was either. And we heal the relationship.